Okay. Uh, this is gonna be part two. Discussion with the planting company. I was in the winter playroom advertising the upcoming book sale. Our star product was doubtless gonna be the Rosemond's workshop collect Rosemond Workshop's collection of Aaron's Bach night stories. As told by Aurelia, I was really looking forward to the whole event as I expected that it would lead to a huge spike in stories from other duchies gathered at the Royal Academy next year. Stories from other duchies? That sounds delightful. After reading so many tales set in the Royal Academy, I'm dying to attend myself. Such praise came from the children too young to be students themselves. Most of them were talking taller than me, but it was still cute to see them chattering in excitement. Aaronfest books were starting to have an, an infusion... An influence even in the Royal Academy, I said. Do read them carefully before you attend. And if you share the books you have with your friends, then you can read an even greater selection. Books were expensive, even for nobles. Few houses could afford to purchase several volumes at once, so instead they would save up to buy one and then exchange it for others. Plant and company sales would, could only increase so, be increased so much in Aaronfest, which was why I needed to sell another, to other duchies as well. Hartman, Sylvester Scholars will, sco will contact the planting company when the date is set, correct, I asked. Add a line to today's message requesting that they see me in the morning of the day of. Is there something about the castle's yearly book sale that you need to discuss with them, he asked. I believe they are quite busy that day due to their meetings with the Gibes. This year, the planting company was having to speak with Haldensdale and Grossel too, since they were going to be selling the books printed in their, pre their provinces. I needed to attend those meetings as well to ensure both the planting company was the, that the planting company wasn't bullied into submission by the Gibes, and that the Gibes weren't scammed by Benno. I intend to inform those of them of our printing deal with with Dunkelfelger, for it will be discussed at the Archduke conference. I said I, we need to speak with the planting company about the book rights we had won from our dinner game against Dunkelfelger, and about our plans for the future. We required this information before we discuss, could discuss it at the conference. Understood, Hartman replied. I will go to the Archduke's office. It is time for your meeting with the plant company, milady. After receiving this news from Riarda, I awaited my room, or exit my room with my scholars in tow. Charlotte was already waiting outside the door while Wilfred was standing at the bottom of the stairs. We must discuss things with the planting company before the books can be sold, correct? Charlotte asked. This will be our first time attending such a meeting. I have asked your knights to contact them before, sister, but they was, it was always your knight and attendant in the playroom who deals with everything. I already knew from Ferdinand that Daniel had worked exceptionally hard while he was asleep in the Dereve, but Charlotte was the one who had actually taken up the task of running the playroom. According to her, my garden knights have provided a great deal of assistance. Charlotte turned to Daniel and said, You were such a great help. He gave a humble nod in response. Daniel is very skilled at paperwork as well, I declared from inside Leslie, and even in the temple he is often invaluable. Ferdinand entrusts more work to him than just about, than just about anyone. I see, Charlotte replied. His efficient delegation and precise instructions truly moved me. Back when Charlotte had first come to the winter playroom, she had proven to be entirely clueless, unable to give proper orders even to her own retainers. She explained that my guard knights had done much to support her at the time. I was surprised that all your guard knights are so capable when it comes to scholar work, and Charlotte continued, staring at me in admiration. I glanced over at Angelica, tempted to point her out as the lone exception to my sister's compliment, but I chose to hold my tongue and smile instead. By the time we arrived at the meeting room, discussions between the Gabes and the planted company were already underway. I could see Benno, Mark, and Damien. We exchanged noble greetings, and after confirming that the book sale would proceed just as last year, Damien left with the playroom attendants in pr to prepare. Now, regarding the sales of any books not made in the Rosemine workshop, Benno said. He then went on to explain things from my sibling scholars who had never attended one of these meetings before. All of our books had thus far been made into the, in the Rosemine workshop, but we were now building new printing workshops in other provinces. Today, they were discussing the commission that the, pr the planted company would charge for selling books made in Haldensdale and Groschel until they could establish their own bookstores, and the planted company would serve as a sales channel into other duchies. These first deals were going to be crucial. Our negotiations began with us considering the many stages that were going to be involved in the sales process, such as how the books were going to be transported to the castle, when they were going to be sold, and when we intended to store them, or where we intended to store them. I can see that you charged quite a lot more to have the planting company conduct the books, Gabe Groschel said, fixing Benno with a doubtful and searching look. Transportation costs are significant, I replied with a smile. We nobles can use teleportation circles, but commoners primarily use boats or carriages to transport goods. The time, investment, and amount of manpower required are by no means small, 
and the speed at which they can travel will depend on how far the locations are from each other and whether the roads are well paved. All of these variables must be considered when working out the cost, which is why Haldensdale will need to pay more in transportation fees than Groschel. Sending the books to the castle using the teleportation circles used to move taxes would require mana, but not cost any money. Alternatively, using commoners to transport goods would remove the mana cost, but it also introduced the risk of goods being damaged on the bumpy roads. There was also the transportation fees to consider, which would reduce the amount of potential profit unless the price the goods were being sold for was raised to comp compensate. For now, we can send the books alongside our taxes to reduce the mana expense, but that option will not last forever, Guy Paldenzel said, with a grimace aware that Elvira's love story authors Squadron was growing in power and selling increasingly more books. Eventually, there would be too many to make teleporting them worthwhile. At the moment, I am researching teleportation circles and experimenting with lowering their mana expenditure, I said. By the time every province has a printing guild and printing workshop, teleportation, teleporting books should be quite effect, affordable. You certainly have great foresight, Lady Rosemine. Wait, when did you start doing that? The geese were looking at me with wide eyes as was Wilfred. It seemed that unlike Ferdinand, they hadn't realized what I was doing this entire this entirely for my own benefit. I deepened my smile, keeping that knowledge to myself. This research is being done by someone so talented that Ferdinand took them on as a disciple, so we can expect them to provide excellent results. Once the matter of transportation costs was settled, the commission for selling the books was decided without issue. The tension drained from the room at once. That settles the discussion between Holdensdale, Groschel, and the planting company. I turned to the two geeps. You, Wilfred, and Charlotte may depart. What are you planning, Wilfried asked, his green eyes sharpening as he looked between these and the plant, those of the planted company and me. I have further matters to discuss with the planted company, I said. I must report upcoming plans, and I have no other personal questions as well. Or I have other personal questions as well. I needed to ask about the young Klassenberg girl, woman they had taken as Lahange, and about the Gutenbergs in, quite, in general, if time permitted. Is there something you don't want me to hear? Not in the least. You're welcome to stay if you have the time and interest. I, too, wish to hear more about the printing industry, Gabe Groschel said, and so he, Wilfried, Charlotte, and Gabe Haldenzell stayed. It meant that I couldn't bring up anything too personal, but there was no reason I could give in, I could give to refuse them. I turned to Benno. At the Royal Academy, we are borrowing books to transcribe and getting apprentice scholars to gather stories from other duchies. I expect that books containing those stories will spread throughout the Royal Academy next year. The raw at the Royal Academy next year, you say, Benno asked. I could tell that he was doing a bunch of calculations in his head. I gave a nod. They won't actually be sold until next summer, and since picture book Bibles are so useful for improving one's grades, we do not intend to spread them yet. Our focus is primarily on night and romance stories. Those in the Royal Academy seemed quite receptive to them this year. Benno's dark red eyes gleamed like those of a predator eyeing its prey. The air in the room sharpened, and as the discussion turned into a bloodthirsty business meeting about profits, I couldn't help but grin. During the introductory tournament, we won the rights to publish books from Dunkelfelder the, the second, I said. The details are going to be settled at the Archduke Conference, and the deal shall serve as our basis for the contracts we make with other duchies. I thought it best to discuss these terms with you before the conference itself. I couldn't just leave everything to Sylvester's scholars, considering how inexperienced with printing they were. We needed to decide the terms and conditions we would give Dunkelfelger in advance so they could serve as a foundation for future deals. Lady Rosemine, are you truly making books containing stories from other duchies? Keep Halden so asked. Indeed, I replied with an enthusiastic nod. The bulk of our Duchy's night stories are based on those I gather from children in the Winter Playroom. They were exceptionally delighted to see their own tales published. If we are to start selling to other Duchies, we, we are more likely to garner their interest by having stories from their homes. I see. Then you will need love stories from other Duchies as well, Keep Haldensdale me murmured. Hearing the words love stories come from such a stone-faced man was strange to say the least. But he clearly visualized such tales purely as products to be sold for profit. It seemed that he also understood commoners, and an instant later, he was thinking about how to involve his province's printing industry in my plans. He groschel in contrast appeared to be lost. He sat still, his brows drawn together in a deep frown. Haldensdale was making the books Elvira and the others write, so I imagine there are many manuscripts to be printed, I said. Groschel does not have any writers of note yet, so I under as I understand it, so, if you like, you can print the stories we gather ourselves. I wanted, wanted to compile night stories from all over Jurgen Schmidt into a single collection, and Roderick's Ditter story wasn't yet printed yet. At this point, there are more stories than there were printing workshops, so having Groschel take some of was more than ideal. Keep Groschel stared down at me with a start. Yes, I would very much appreciate the opportunity, he said, taking the offer immediately. 
Furthermore, Lady Rosemary Benno noted, we have a report from the Gutenbergs. According to Johann, the Smiths from Groschel are improving considerably. He expects to return them home in spring. As for Zach, he says that he has finished the job you gave him. He wants to know whether he should deliver to your room to the te in the temple or the castle. A job he was referring to was the mattress I smiled. My comfy bed was finally complete. Have it delivered to the temple, I said. We may settle the details when you give your next financial report. And finally, regarding the Klassenbrook merchant that we are hosting for a year, Benno said, bringing up Corinne before I even had needed to ask. Her work as a Lahange is spectacular. There have been many occasions where I have had no choice but to bow to the power of a greater duchy merchant, and we are looking to incorporate many of her ideas into our store. As it turned out, she also learned much about other duchies on her way to Aaronfest. I pray that this is of some use to you. This prompted Mark to hold out a stack of papers, which Hartman accepted and then gave to me. A quick leaf through the pages was enough for me to glean that the information was not from not just the planting company, but from the Guildmaster and other major store owners as well. You have my gratitude, Benno, I said. Av Aaronfest will surely rejoice. As these were, there are many eye, so many eyes on me, I couldn't ask anything more personal than that. You gather intelligence from commoners as well, Lady Rosemont Geek Rochel asked, blinking in surprise. There was a very firm and clear line drawn between the nobles' quarter and the lower city in his province. They were striving to listen to their workers when it came to the printing industry, but they hadn't expected that there was anything else for them to learn from commoners. Merchants have many connections, and can therefore acquire very valuable intelligence, I replied. They often know things one could never learn in the nobles' quarter. Wolfrey, Charlotte, you have learned a great deal while performing spring prayer and the harvest festival, did you not? They both nodded, having spent a great deal of time outside the nobles' quarter to oversee religious ceremonies. Indeed, there is much one could learn without seeing it with the one's own eyes, Charlotte said. This co the commoners thanking us when we use our mana for their sake motivates us to work harder, Wolfrey added. It reminds me I need to become a good archduke one day. It was Geep Haldensdale who blinked in surprise this time, then his expression softened. Commoners cannot live without our mana, but we nobles would suffer without commoners. If you understand this and work with it in mind, then you will surely become a good archduke. Wolfrey was regularly mocked from the shadows for the Arab movable state on his reputation, and cruel rumors claimed that he was becoming the next archduke, not because he deserved it, but because he was engaged to me. He was so familiar with insults that the Gieves' praise came as a genuine comfort, and with a proud smile he said, Thank you, I shall do my best. Charlotte was watching all this very carefully indeed. During the book sale that afternoon, the love stories that Elvira and her friends had written proved to be overwhelmingly popular and were selling like hotcakes. The Ehrensbach night stories printed in Airfest were a distant second, and those of the former Veronica faction came in cheerful droves to buy them. I praised, purchased one as well, but not for myself. Lampret, do give this to Aurelia, I said, offering the book to him. He was attending with Wolfried, serving us as guard knight. Consider it my thanks for her giving us the stories in the, few, in the first place. She had so graciously shared them, these tales with us during the, the dying competition, so it seemed only natural that she should get to enjoy them as well. Lampert accepted the book with a smile. Thank you. My wife will surely rejoice at the opportunity to read your book, Lady Rosmond. It was only slight, but out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Daniel avert his gaze the moment he heard the word wife. Oh, Daniel, poor guy. He'll pro at this rate, he's never going to get a wife. I feel so bad for him. The poor guy's going to be single forever. He just wants love. Is that so wrong? Melkor's baptism. The feast celebrating spring was due to be held several days after the book sale. Melkor was going to have his baptism ceremony. So Lazeletta and Brunhilde had gone to the temple to fetch the clothes and other things we needed. Fran and Monica had everything ready for our arrival, Lady Rosemine, Lazeletta said with a smile once my ceremonial high bishop robes and such were looked over. Apparently when they had reached the temple, Ferdinand and my att Ferdinand's and my attendants had already sorted everything into boxes and carried it all to the entrance to be collected. This is a gift from to you from the children of the orphans, Brunhilde added, at showing me a small jar. I am told it is Peru juice. A winter sweet then, I replied, please give it to Ella. Brunhilde nodded and made her way to the kitchen. Fran was worried about your health and whether you'd been working to increase your stamina, so I said that you'd been doing light exercise at the night training grounds. Daniel explained, having accompanied the girls on their trip. I asked about Monica and everyone else in the temple, too, and thankfully it seemed that they were all doing fine. That was when Audley returned, holding two letters of invitation. Lady Rose, my Lady Charlotte, and Lord Wolfrey have invited you to a tea party, she said. I appreciate that this might seem quite sudden, but they wish to introduce you to Melkor before his baptism. Charlotte's invitation included a note saying that she had been she had cherished the opportunity to have a tea party with me prior to her own, her own baptism ceremony. In truth, it wasn't a very pleasant memory for me. I mostly remembered how Wolfrey had inter interrupted us, turning everything on its head. 
At the very least, I suppose that tea party was when I found out just how adorable Charlotte really is. I never spoken to Melkor before, so I wanted to meet with him at least once before his baptism. After sending out replies to accepting the invitation, I waited for the tea party while training, transcribing books with my scholars. I need to work hard so I can be a good big sister to Melkor too. Good evening, sister. I was overjoyed to receive your invitation, Charlotte. I exchanged greetings with Charlotte, who was hosting the tea party, and then looked at Melkor, who was beside Wilfrid and waiting for an introduction. He had the same purplish-blue hair as his father, and the same blue eyes and soft facial features as his mother, which made him look kind and peaceful, but there was one thing I noticed that was more important than any of that. I win. He was shorter than me. <laughs> He's seven, dude! What do you expect? It may only be by the smallest amount, but I'm taller. Even if we look the same age, people are more likely to realize I'm his older sister. <laughs> For this re record, I'm not on tiptoes either. The very real possibility that I was shorter than Melkor had worried me to no end, but with that fear out of the way, my excitement shot through the roof. Everything was bound to go swimmingly. This is our little brother Melkor, Wolfram said. I hope you can get along with him as well as we do. Now, Melkor, this is Rosemine, your older sister, and the High Bishop is going to bless you at your baptism. Rosemine, I haven't been baptized yet, so I can't give proper blessings, but please let me greet you, Melkor said, stepping forward with a tense expression. He knelt down, bowed his head, and it's intoned, I am Melkor, son of Ab Arenfest. May I pray for a blessing and appreciation of this serendipitous meeting ordained by the harsh judgment of Avaglaive, the God of Life. You may. May Avaglaive, the God of Life, bless you, Rosemine. May our relationship be long and prosperous, Melkor said. He then looked up at Wilfred and Charlotte with a satisfied grin of someone who had recited the lines they were taught to perfection. They watched him with gentle smiles. Well done, Melkor, Wolfrey said. Indeed, Charlotte agreed. I too was nervous during my first greeting. You did well. It was adorable to see the young Melkor so over the moon about receiving such praise from his older siblings. His education was clearly proceeding exceptionally smoothly under Florencia's guidance, and seeing him smile made me smile too. The children's room has been ever so lonely since you went to the northern building, Charlotte. Melkor said, I've ne been hoping to join you there as soon as possible. I'm glad we can have tea parties together now. Yes, I'm likewise glad to be spending time with you after so long apart, Charlotte replied, gently stroking her little brother's smooth-looking hair. Hmm? You know, you and Rosemine look like actual siblings, what with your hair being so similar, Wolfram observed, touching Melkor's hair and comparing it to mine. It certainly was the case that we both shared the same purplish-blue hair as Sylvester, while Wolfram and Charlotte had light gold hair instead. Oh, hers is more a light, a dark blue. Whatever. Oh, it's so cute! <laughs> I wonder, is Kamio growing up like this too? He should be about five now, I think. Mom, Dad, and Tuli are already showering him with love, so he's bound to be like this. At that, I searched through my memories, trying to remember my last time seeing Kamio through the temple doors. Thinking about it, his hair was a very similar color to mine and Sylvester's as well. I wish Kamio could call me his big sister too, but of course that dream can never come true anymore. Rosamond has brought a sweet that you have never tried before, Charlotte said, urging us to sit, and at that the tea party began. We all sipped our tea and took bites of our sweets. Back when the Offmer Company had delivered pound cake for the Intertouchy Tournament, they had given me freshly made gelatin as a gift. I had asked Ella to make some Bavarios with it which I had brought with me today, and this was my first time serving it to anyone else. I could see Brunhilde quietly watching to see how my siblings would react. It goes down easily and tastes quite delicious, Charlotte said. Are there the flavors? There can be many. This this one uses Peru, a winter, a winter sweet. I took a bite as well. Peru was a nostalgic flavor for me as it reminded me of the lower city. I could feel a smile rise on my face, and before I knew it, I was positively beaming. It's sweet, Melkor remarked, but it feels weird in my mouth, Rosemine. Yeah, I prefer cookies, Wilfred said. It seemed that while Charlotte thought highly of the Bavarios, Bavarios, whatever, the boys found it a bit off-putting. I wouldn't be able to serve it in the Royal Academy unless I could improve the recipe. Pudding wasn't very popular at first, so I guess it's no surprise that the, Bar the Bavarios isn't either. Wilfred turned to Melkor and said, Are you feeling nervous about your baptism tomorrow? It was an inevitable topic of conversation considering the circumstances. Well, I've been told I need to go in alone, Wil Melkor replied quietly. I also felt very nervous entering the hall with so many eyes on me, Charlotte said with a smile. But it cal I calmed down a little when I saw Rosemine waiting for me on the stage. You simply need to walk over to her, Melkor. There is nothing to worry about. Upon hearing those words, Melkor seemed to relax a little. 
Your baptism was in the winter, though, Charlotte, so at least you got to walk with the other kids going to their debut, Wilfred said. Melkor's going to be walking alone like I did. That's way more nerve-wracking. Winter baptisms were done alongside the debuts, but children who were to be baptized in any other season would normally have a priest come to their home and carry out a private ceremony instead. Those born in spring had to walk through the Grand Hall alone for their baptisms. I remember that Karsten and Abara had walked with me during my own ceremony. There had been a great number of visitors then, but that was still much better than lit being at the castle where basically all nobles would gather. I watched with a smile as Wilfred and Charlotte explained the process of the baptism to Melkor, occasionally arguing with each other over minor details and such. So what things do you like, Melkor? I asked. I like the toys you make, Rosemine. You make all of them, didn't you? Wilfred and Charlotte told me. They said you were very amazing. As it turned out, thanks to Florencia and Charlotte reading books to him, as well as Wilfred teaching him to play with cards and playing cards, Melkor had come to think of me as a very amazing older sister. That's right, I'll show you the power of an amazing sister. Thank you so much, Wilfred, Charlotte. I was so excited that I grew emotional and I clenched my fist under the table to seal my resolve. Melkor gave an adorable smile. The books you make are so enjoyable, Rosamund, so if you have more, I would very much like to read them. I really love books. Oh, he's killing me. Oh, he's killing me with kindness. He just said that he loves books and with such a genuine smile. Having a bookworm little brother is even more wonderful than I imagined. I want to praise the gods for blessing me with such a great force. Oh, no, 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 no. Watch what you say. Watch what you say. I started to tremble, trying to contain my mana before it burst out. Riarda must have noticed as she came over to check on me with a worried expression. This was a tea party among siblings, so I didn't have the mana storing necklace that Ferdinand had given me. Please calm down, my lady. I am fine, Riarda, I said. I can still go on. After attending me te many tea parties with my bookworm friends in the Royal Academy, my tolerance in situations like this had improved, even if not by very much. Not even death would could stop me from rec recommending Melkor more books and making him into an even more of a bookworm. Melkor, what manner of stories do you like? I asked with a broad smile. Night stories, perhaps? At the moment, we have many tales from other duchies. They have not yet been made into books, but we have them written down. Melkor looked at me quizzically and then returned a smile. My favorite stories are the ones about the gods. I can play cards or two now, so the attendants often read the book, picture book Bibles to me. Wolfrey told me I need to learn about the gods to be like you, Rosemine. He likes the picture book Bibles? They were considered essential textbooks in Aaronfest. Kids would read them on a regular basis to help them win at cards or progress in their, theo in their theological studies, but for you would say they outright enjoyed those stories about the gods. Very well, if you like stories about the gods, Melkor, then by the gods you shall have them. Riarda retrieved the High Bishop's Bible from the temple at once and no, 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 no. They are not to leave the temple. It's not to leave the temple. Riarda interrupted me with a light pat on the shoulder. Milady, I understand that you wish to dote on Lord Melkor, but please calm down. Has Arbor Ferdinand not told you that you should not show the High Bishop's Bible to others so readily? We didn't want other people seeing the weird text in Magic Circle if we could help it. A transcription should work then. I believe Lord Melkor is still too young to understand his more complicated vocabulary. You can simply tell him the stories that are not yet in the picture books. But I wanted to share one in the book. Girl, all you gotta do is transcribe the stories from the Bible and then make picture books for that. Duh. Just like you do with the picture book Bibles. Just do that. Despite my own feelings on the matter, Riarda was in the right. So I set up for simply telling Melkor the religious star stories. His blue eyes sparkled as he listened, and at that moment I raised off to prioritize getting him a new book. After having a delightful time with my new sibling, my new brother, I saw him in his retainer off as he returned to the main building. Melkor truly is adorable, I said, showing the strength of my resolve to Wilfred and Charlotte. I wish to dote on him as much as I can. Charlotte pursed her lips in dissatisfaction. Somehow, I feel as if my older sister has been stolen from me. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. You're both adorable. You've still got it better than me, Wolfred replied, pouting as well. Rosemine is soft on people younger than her, and even softer on girls. You should have seen how she treated me on our first meeting. I've never seen her act this sweet in my life. Rosemine, you should treat me a little better, you know, especially since we're seeing as we're engaged. Oh my, I replied, but Ferdinand has always told me I am too soft on you. What? Wolfred stared at me in genuine confusion. I can't remember a single time you've been soft on me, let alone too soft, before your debut and during the Ivory Tower incident. In both cases, Ferdinand said that I was too soft on you, but perhaps he would rather I start being more harsh? Wilfred said nothing in response. He merely continued to watch me with wide eyes. Just as Flu Trend and Helschmere heal in their own ways, I treat you differently than I do my younger siblings, I continued. As you are my fiancé, you must grow and mature far more than normal. 
You do not need the compassion that I show Charlotte and Melkor. After letting out a quiet grunt, Wolfried started con silently conceded he was unable to argue back. Thus came the day of Melkor's baptism. I wasn't with Wolfred and Charlotte like, like, like last year. Instead, as the High Bishop, I was going to be entering with Ferdinand the High Priest. Rosemine, use enhancement magic so that you can walk properly, Ferdinand muttered, dressed in his own blue ceremonial robes and staying a pace behind me as we walked through the Grand Bit Hall. I started channeling Mana through my body in response. If one ignored the fact that I still needed to take three steps for each one Ferdinand took, well, I mean, he's a lot, he has longer legs, so of course he's going to be able to do farther than you. There was nothing unusual about my walking whatsoever. As expected, the hall was packed with nobles. Having so many eyes boring into me still made me tense enough that I walk with my back perfectly straight, but at the same time, I was quite used to it. I certainly had come a long way since my early days as the High Bishop. There was a shrine set up on the stage, with the Archdugal couple and their retainers lined up on the left. I went over and joined them, whereupon Sylvester stood up and took center stage. For the train, the goddess of waters, pure streams, have washed away Aeoglade, the god of life, and rescued Gadol, the goddess of earth. Blessed be the melting of the snow. As his declaration, the feast celebrating spring began. First, allow me to announce this year's honor students, Sylvester continued. Thirteen students obtained this honor through their high grades this year. A tremendous number. The news caused the room to erupt in cheers and applause, although there was a clear understand undercurrent of surprise. Again, I was the only person to come first in class. But there were many being recognized as honor students. Among them were Le Lenore, Cornelius, and Hartman from my retainers, Wilfred and three of his retainers, Charlotte and two of her retainers, plus Matthias and one other from the former of Veronica faction. Well done, Rosemont, Sylvester said. Here is your gift. May it prove useful to you. I noticed that the commemorate commemorative face stones being handed out as rewards were smaller than last year. This was probably because there were more honor students than the budget had accounted for and could accommodate. I accepted mine with a small smile. After the honor students were awarded, Aaron Fest's overall grades were announced. We had come 10th in the introductory tournament stitter games. This might have seemed disappointing to some, considering that we had come 6th in the mock battle, but the apprentice knights were praised very highly for their coordination. After all, they had slain the rare and troublesome babies known as a Hunter Taylung. Given all that happened at the Royal Academy, Bonifacius will continue to train the Apprentice Knights and new recruits to the Knights Order, Sylvester said. Put your all into it, everyone. He also spoke of the Apprentice Scholar's results and the tremendous growth shown by the Apprentice attendance. Aaron Fest's influence was steadily rising after our business deals with Klassenberg and the Sovereignty, and it was known that we had done drawn much attention during the introductory tournament. We received a great number of marriage requests from other duchies as the other duchies this year, Sylvester continued. We will answer these after some very careful consideration. Furthermore, we introduced Aaron Fest books to Royal Academy Socializing to great success. I intend to begin selling these books next year, so all those involved do not slack on your preparations. The Gibbs and nobles involved in the printing and papermaking industries all seemed to tense up. At this early stage, what mattered most was how many preparations could be made before the selling began. Last of all, there was the debut of new adults who had graduated the Royal Academy alongside announcements of where they were going to be working. To that end, the graduating students lined up on the stage. Cornelius and Hartman were my retainers, so their jobs wouldn't change. Instead, they would simply move up from apprentice to full-fledged adults. Now we shall hold the baptism ceremony for my son, Melkor, so as I said, Hi, Bishop, if you would. After the feast came the baptism ceremony, so I carefully climbed up the stairs leading up to the, onto the stage, making sure not to step on the hem of my robes. Ferdinand stood next to me and said in a booming voice, Welcome, new child of Aaron Fest. As if on cue, instruments began to play, and the doors of the Grand Hall slowly opened to reveal Melkor, who had evidently been waiting behind them. With a childish smile, his clothes were a bluish green and didn't seem to conflict with his hair color at all. He didn't seem that nervous to me, but he must have taken Charlotte's advice to heart, as I could see his blue eyes fixed on me as he slowly climbed the stage. Melkor said, holding out a mounted detecting tool, enveloped in, the, in thin leather that stopped my mana from flowing into it. He took it, and a moment later, it flashed, spurring the hall into another round of great applause. Next, Melkor registered his mana to an ivory medal. You have the divine protection of five gods, darkness, water, fire, wind, and earth, I said. If you dedicate yourself to becoming worthy of their protection, you will surely receive many blessings. Once the registration was complete, Ferdinand swiftly placed the medal inside a box. Sylvester used that time to return to the center of the stage with an important magic tool in hand, a ring with a green face stone. I grant this ring to Melkor, who has been recognized by the gods as my son, Sylvester said. Congratulations. Thank you, Father. Sylvester acknowledged his son's happy smile, then looked up and signaled me with his eyes. I gave a brisk nod in response, filled my ring of mana, and said, May Flutrain, the goddess of water, bless Melkor. Perhaps because he was my cute little brother and a fellow bookworm to me, more green light flew out of my ring than I intended. Whoops. Was that a bit too much? No, surely not. It was fine. Right, Ferdinand? 
I glanced over and saw that Ferdinand was fixing me with a cold stare, more or less calling me a fool with his eyes. Eep, okay, it was too much. But it was no use crying over spilled milk. My blessing couldn't be taken back, so I took it in my stride. In turn, Melkor began pushing Mana into it, the ring on his finger. Thank you, said, he said, and a bit of green light flew over to me, bringing his, own, his baptism to a close. And so the northern building obtained a new resident, and my life in the castle became a lot more lively. I shall offer the gods my prayers and gratitude for blessing me with this bookworm little brother. Ooh, here we go, here we go. Let's see, let's see. Ox fish cuisine. The feast celebrating spring marked the end of the winter socializing. The nobles began returning to their own provinces while those living in the nobles' quarter started working as normal. As for me, my time at the dinner table became a bit more animated since Melkor was now raiding with us. Am I right to assume you're going to be go going to back to the temple soon, as you usually do, Rosemine? Sylvester asked with narrowed eyes. No, I don't intend to return for a little while longer, I replied. He would have been right under normal circumstances, but not this year. He had yet to deliver on his most important promise. How come? Has something happened? Really? That's his response? I see he's forgotten his sacred vow. I pursed my lips. Sylvester, were you not going to teach me my chefs how to cook fish? I have been blaming for this ever since returning from the Royal Academy. By this point, so many days had passed that I was about to be sent back to the temple whether I wanted to go there or not. It was a disaster. Sylvester clapped his hands together in a show of apparent realization. Right, right. Just ask Ferdinand to bring the ingredients over. Once the chefs have them, I'll tell them to make some traditional Ehrensbach recipes. Thank you, I replied. I was wearing a composed and elegant smile, but under the table, my fists were clenched in victory. Yippee! I can finally eat fish! Finally, finally, finally! And this wasn't going to be the gross, muddy fish from Ehrenfest and dirty rivers, either. This was proper fish from Ehrensbach Oceans. How many years had passed since I was afforded such a grand opportunity? I couldn't help but get excited, and as I thanked Aurelia for bringing something so tasty from Ehrensbach to begin with, I suddenly realized something. Sylvester, the fish that Ferdinand is storing came from Aurelia, who brought it to Ehrenfest so that she could enjoy the flavors of her home, I said. I wish to share the results with her as well. So can I have permission to invite her for a meal on that day it is made? Hmm. Sylvester fell into thought for a bit, then looked at Carset, who was standing behind him. If we have Aurelia in attendance, then we'll need to bring more guards and decide whether to invite Lampra and the rest of your estate, but I don't have a problem with the invitation itself. That was the answer I wanted to hear, but as I celebrated, Florencia called out to me in a gentle voice. Rosemine, Aurelia may be nostalgic for the food of her home, but we do not know if she will be fit to come. Be certain to check with Lampret or Elvara before inviting her. Florencia had taken extra care to avoid outright saying that Aurelia was pregnant. Indeed, if Aurelia was suffering from morning sickness or was starting to show, she wouldn't be able to come to the castle to eat even if she wanted to. And if she was feeling unwell, there was a chance that she wouldn't even be able to taste the food. She was also uncomfortable being around a lot of people, and if she received a formal invitation from me, she would more or less be forced to attend. Though I really do want to give her the chance to enjoy these traditional Ehrensbach meals. Wolfried, can I borrow Lampert for a bit, I asked, and are on our way back to our rooms after dinner. I wish to speak with him about Aurelia. Sure. Having been granted time to talk to Lampert, I asked him to accompany me to the room in the main building closest to the northern building. He was joining me as family rather than an official capacity, which meant I still needed Cornelius with me as a guard. But he had a relaxed expression as well. Lampert, how was Aurelia, I asked, when he arrived. Will she be able to join us in the castle for an errand about cooking? Mm, I don't know, he muttered, his arms crossed in thought. I think she'd struggle as she is now. She's been having a hard time eating at the moment, so I'd rather you not send an invitation. If you do, you'll have no, we'll have no choice but to attend. It seemed that Aurelia was having a rather miserable time with her pregnancy. She was too sick to move and spent her days vomiting and sleeping. Mama has been able had been able to move while pregnant, but he, her health had sometimes taken a turn for the worse, and she had felt sick all the time. Not to mention, Lampra continued, if she gets to the castle, she'll need to remove her veil. Oh, right, that would be an issue. I realized I'd never seen her face before, I said. Lampert, have you seen her without her veil on? Lampert blinked in surprise, then chuckled. Of course I have. I mean, she almost never wears it when she's in her room. She just doesn't want uh, to invite any misunderstandings that would damage relations between Aaron Erebus and Ehrensbach. She didn't wear a veil during her time at the Royal Academy either, you know. I was curious as to how Lampert and Aurelia had grown closer when she was always wearing a veil, but as it turned out, she hadn't actually worn one in the Royal Academy. That made sense. A face covering would have impacted her performance in her apprentice night course. I think Aurelia will continue to wear her veil in Ehrenfest until things with Ehrenspock have been patched up, Lampert said. She's a fairly timid girl. I somewhat sensed that while watching her socialize, I replied. She's stuck close behind Mother at all times. 
After some thought, I decided to use a time-stopping magic tool to f bring her her hot, freshly made food. Aurelia had used the magic tool to begin with so that she could enjoy Aaron's black cuisine whenever she wanted, so it was more or less restoring things to how they had originally been. So in short, after we cooked the traditional Aaron's black meals, I want you to bring the time-stopping magic tool for Aurelia, I said. Lamper patted me on the head, a broad smile on his lips. Thanks for putting so much thought into all this, Rosemont. I'm sure Aurelia will really appreciate it. But that means I won't get invited either, Cornelius grumbled as he prodded my cheek. Sad to miss out, he meant to be missing out on Aaron's black cooking. If we were taking the food to Aurelia, instead of asking her to dinner, that meant we wouldn't need to invite the whole Carstead estate. <laughs> Sorry, Cornelius. Upon returning to my room, I sent an ordinance to Ferdinand with a simple message. Bring the fish when you can. It's time to learn Aaron's black cuisine. He replied with a curt, understood, and with that confirmation, I was able to sleep peacefully that night. It was during breakfast the very next morning that Riarda informed me that fish had arrived at the castle. I sent an ordinance to Ferdinand, noticing that he had acted much faster than I expected, and asked whether he was looking forward to the fish as well, but his response immediately laid those thoughts to rest. I am not particularly looking forward to it. The tool simply required a considerable amount of mana, so I would rather stop supplying it. I would also like you to return to the temple as soon as possible. He was clearly trying to refute the idea, but he also noted that he was going to be spending the entire day working at the castle, so there was no mistaking his enthusiasm for the food. Ferdinand came to the night training grounds later that day at the same time I was doing my light exercise, which gave me the perfect opportunity to probe him for information. So, what fish did Aurelia bring to Arifestus, asked. Please show them to me. Give it up. Norbert already has had them taken to the kitchen. You will not see them until dinner tonight. Naturally, a high-status rich girl such as myself couldn't just go wandering into the kitchen. My only choice was to wait until dinner time, which was something of a disappointing realization. Still, today was the day Hugo and Ella were going to learn from the court chefs to prepare the ingredients so that they could make traditional Ehrensbach meals for Aurelia. They wouldn't be cooking anything to suit my personal tastes. Patience, Rosemine, patience. Still, Ferdinand, it's rare to see you out here training with the knights rather than helping Sylvester with his work, I remarked. Is there a reason for that? He paused for a moment and then said, I wish, simply wish for a change of pace. He wasn't sure I believed him, though. He seemed to be taking this training very seriously. Bonifacius and Eckert were eagerly serving as his partners, and Angelica was watching on with an expression of pure greed, wanting nothing more than to join in herself. I'm going to be doing my usual exercises with Daniel, I informed Angelica, so you are welcome to join Ferdinand and the others. I appreciate that this must be a rare opportunity. Oh, Lady Rosemont, I thank you ever so much, Angelica exclaimed with a beaming smile. She sprinted over to her fellow knights like the wind while I continued my usual cycle of doing some light exercise and resting. I contacted the kitchen after doing my exercises, asking them to put aside some of the ingredients for me to bring back to the temple. Then started writing down more recipes I remembered. It was probably best for us to go with a western dish this time, something like fish marinade, Carpaccio or uh, Munier or something soaked in oil and cooked in herbs. There was also broths and stews like Aqua Paz or Boulabas. I cannot talk. Frittered and fried were good too, but as was fish gratin. I wasn't sure whether the fish we had could be eaten raw, so some of the recipes I was considering were probably off the table. My heart raced just thinking about all the tasty culinary avenues we could venture down. What I want to eat most is simple salt grilled fish, the kind where you could cut a cross shape into it, throw on some salt, and then grill it plain. The salt would make white bumps on the fish, and the scorch marks would make it crisp. Peeling the skin, peeling the skin off with chopsticks would result in puffs of steam and a delicious aroma, and some sour citrus juice on top was nothing short of complete bliss. The only thing it needed to be perfect with some freshly cooked white rice or dried Japanese sake. Unfortunately, I'm too young to drink in this world. How I miss having the body of a 22-year-old. Still, the very thought of all the fish dishes from my Arano days made me hungry. If we could get some soy sauce, there was also the option of making a Japanese stew, but there was nothing here that could satisfy that craving. Perhaps it was a fish sauce made of some kind in Aaron's Bach that we could use, but that simply wouldn't make for a good enough substitute, as it saved Lutrain and Hellsmere heal in their own ways. Before I knew it, dinner time had arrived. I was positively brimming with excitement as I came out of my room and started toward the dining hall with my siblings. Today's dinner is traditional Aaron's Buck cooking using ingredients that Aurelia brought to the Garen Festa set. This is going to be my first time trying it. Aaron's Buck cooking, huh? Wolfrey replied, looking somewhat wistful. We used to eat that sometimes. Grandmother loved it. He had apparently been raised on a regular dish of 
died of errands while cooking while in Veronica's care. I asked what the food was like so eager that I was practically leaning out the window of my panda bus. Rosemine, do you love new sweets and recipes? Melkor asked, his eyes wide with surprise. Charlotte giggled. Rosemine introduced so many trends precisely because she wishes to eat all the sweets and dishes she enjoys. Perhaps she will start another one after eating tonight's dinner. Well, I can't wait to try this food myself. Back when the ban on socializing with Ehrensbach nobles had come into place, importing Ehrensbach ingredients into Ehrenfest had become significantly harder. It certainly hadn't helped that Veronica was detained and there was no one else to order traditional Ehrensbach cooking. Melkor had no memory of eating Ehrensbach food, while Charlotte just barely remembered having it on a few occasions. This is Zambosup, fish soup with herbs and pomet, po uh, pomace, said one of Sylvester's attendants. After our appetizers, we were served what looked like a, like a bowl of bays. Its appearance wasn't entirely the same. It was yellow instead of red, owing to the pomace, but I expected that it would taste quite similar. I dipped my soup... I spoon into the soup and eagerly brought the liquid to my lips. I drank it down greedily, then sat down my cutlery and slumped over in disappointment. It's been so long since the last time I tasted this can't this cursed dish. It's Jurgen Schmidt's traditional soup, flavorless water. What a disappointment. It seemed that the chefs had used the traditional Jurgen Schmidt soup making method of allowing the ingredients to stew until they were essentially mush, then throwing out all the delicious broth and the amazing fishy flavor it contained. Instead what we had was practically insipid. It was water with some shredded up boiled fish floating in it. The flavored Zambos up was awful, and the fact that my expectations had been so high made it all the more painful. Can't believe all the delicious flavor has been watered down into nothingness. Come back, flavor, come back! The fish that Aurelia had brought with her were exceedingly rare in Aaronfest, and they had been served on wasted on this? I could have died then and there, and my ghost would have haunted the chefs who would produce this atrocity. Eh? Is this really what it's meant to taste like? Sylvester murmured under his breath. Normal soup definitely tastes better, Wolfred said in agreement. Everyone else sitting around the table looked a bit disappointed as well. They had become so accustomed to my dishes packed with flavor that this bland water didn't satisfy them either. As we were bemoaning the disappointing nature of our soup, another dish was brought in. This is the thicken, Sylvester's attendant explained. As far as I could tell, it was white fish munair with a distinctly buttery aroma. My stomach growled in anticipation, but I was reluctant to get my hopes up. Perhaps that had been rendered just as flavorless as the Zambo step. I nervously stabbed my knife into the dish before me and brought a bite to my mouth. I taste fish. I said, almost taken aback. The skin was crispy and properly coated in butter, and the addition of some rigor, some rigor made it a pleasant, garlicky aftertaste. The fish itself practically fell apart in my mouth, having seemingly not been overcooked. All these wondrous sensations had come back from a single bite, and it was so nostalgic that I wanted to shed tears of absolute joy. This is actual fish from the sea, not some weird muddy alternative, but the real deal like I was hoping for. I savored each bite, allowing the flavor of the rare fish to dance on my tongue. It was fairly stand standard manet that had clearly been seasoned and dredged in flavor before flour before being pan fried in butter, and while the rigor was a little unique, it still tasted impressively similar to what I was used to from my Arano days. Back then, I probably would have described the taste as fairly average, but in this world, the average was what I valued more than anything. Unlike that cursed soup, it was delicious. It actually tasted like proper fish. Ah, fish, it's been so long. Thank you, Aurelia. You are my... Verfuremrir, my goddess of the oceans. Okay, we so we knew we knew got it. New, got, new deity, okay. I finished off my thick and almost moved to tears. It was tasty, so as one would expect Minear to be, but I still found myself craving salted fish. I appreciate the thin slices, I said. Could this fish be salted and grilled and served with some citrus juice squeezed on top? As you wish. I waited, excited, only to be served lemon-flavored Minear for some reason. They had added salt as requested, and the buttery taste was mostly replaced with the sourness of the citrus juice. This Monet was a lot more refreshing than the one that was previously served, but it was, wasn't what I had asked for. I had wanted simple, solid fish. Of course, I couldn't complain about the court chefs here and now. One wrong move as my part would inevitably lead to them being fired. I was to blame for the confusion more than anyone. My instructions evidently hadn't been clear enough, and as they were passed from person to person like a game of telephone before they reached the chefs, I needed to speak precisely enough that the specifics of my request would remain intact. Uh, I wanted to eat salt fish. I wasn't being ungrateful by any means. I was still glad to have been afforded the chance to eat fish after such a long time. I was also wearing a genuine smile in stark contrast to Ferdinand, whose dazzling expression was entirely fake. 
It was a smile he gave whenever he was extremely disgusted or otherwise dissatisfied. Clearly, he was thinking that the unimpressive flavor hadn't been worth all the time a man had spent maintaining the, the time-stopping magic tool. There are still some ingredients left over. Are there not? I asked Lays Lada. Tell my chefs to put them back in the time-stopping magic tool. Rose, my why would you make such a request, Ferdinand asked, his smile even more sarcastic. Saccharine than before. I could tell just how much he wanted to yell at me for giving him more work to do than the, as the mana supplier, and it seemed that I wasn't the only one. Wolfred and Charlotte were glancing nervously between him and me. I intend to experiment with cooking fish more at the temple, I replied, aware that I was guaranteed more freedom than, the, than there than here in the temple, or here in the castle. I was also easier to direct the chefs there. It seemed that Ferdinand wasn't satisfied with this answer, however, as I continued. You can make a delicious soup using fish if you properly handle the broth. I wish from the bottom of my heart to improve this Zanzo Zamble sup we had today. I wasn't going to set my standards too high and expect something on the level of soup de poison, aquapaz, or boulebets would do. My main priority was marking something that, making something that actually tasted good. Books, sweets, cuisine, you truly are ravenous when it comes to the things you want, Ferdinand said with a look of exasperation. He was the last person I wanted to hear that from, considering what he was like when it came to delicious consomme and researching magic tools. His fake smile had vanished, though, so I could conclude that he was interested in my proposition. Despite his silent disapproval, Ferdinand hadn't actually forbidden me from taking the remaining ingredients back to the temple. I decided to ask Lysleta to ensure that something else was packed alongside the prepared fish fillet. Do remind them to pack the bones and heads as well. Did you say the bones and heads, Lysleta asked curiously? What would you need those for? I glanced over at Ferdinand, who was once again wearing his fake smile, then back at Lizetta. As one uses chicken bones to make chicken broth, they are essential for making fish broth. If you phrase it like that, I am certain the chefs will understand which parts are important. Very well, Lizetta replied, then headed for the kitchen without making a sound. As I watched her go, I sealed my eyes off to eat some very delicious fish. Incidentally, while we had found the examples up to be terrible, Aurelia had been starved for the Ehrensbach food she was so familiar with and rejoiced over the opportunity to eat it. She hadn't been able to eat the thicken, no matter how good it was, however, so perhaps completely tasteless food was actually more agreeable to her at the moment? Maybe? Okay, let me check. I think I'll end this one off here. I'll see you guys next time.